come and start good day everyone welcome to the 54th lecture of aramira science forum um, let me start with our story vf was vsf was started by a group of amateurs with the intention of taking science engineering and technology to the common person in a language that all of us can relate to uh, we don't want to talk too much of jargon but at the same time we don't want to dilute the essence of science so the stress is more on making the audience understand the topic and make them comfortable we believe this works well when people tell a good story we welcome people from all walks of life who are confident that they can do this and we have had professionals distinguished professionals amateurs and even school kids sharing their experience with us and so this is our story and uh, we started in august 2017 and we are in our fifth year of existence uh, i think this is not bad for a set of people who want to want to talk and listen to science okay our sessions have all been online since april 2020 all our lectures are recorded and available on youtube and we have close to 1.5k subscribers we also have two whatsapp groups where we also talk science okay so uh, this is our facebook twitter instagram and uh, uh, youtube uh, details and if you want to join the whatsapp groups these are the people whom you can uh, text to or uh, whatsapp and in addition to this we also conduct classes on topics related to math so these are some of the classes that we have done we have done classes on linear indeterminate equations kutaka bhavana and chakravala and bija kanita and uh, indian astronomy and mathematics uh, that uh, course by r gopu has uh, i think it has it has happened for four or five times okay so uh, and that brings us to the speaker of the day Uh, the speaker of the day ms deepthi also attended our course on indian maths and astronomy and manages our instagram page she was the one who said that youngsters are all on instagram so you should have a page on instagram thanks deepthi so deepthi has a masters degree in physics from vit and carried out her masters thesis in iit madras in the field of gravitational wave astronomy and she later published it at the 14th edardo amaldi conference for gravitational waves in australia in july 2021 she is extremely passionate about astrophysics she has attended numerous international and national conferences and workshops and has also presented uh, papers and she also happens to be the youngest speaker speaker in our forum till date and um, i welcome you deepthi and uh, she you are also going to talk uh, about your experience so i will not take much uh, time talking about your bio over to you thank you uh, thank you sir thank you for that warm welcome uh, so first off before i start i would like to uh, extend my thanks to uh, goku sir ramanand sir and patri sir for uh, encouraging me to uh, give a talk at this forum it means a lot to me and it's a great opportunity for a, a student like me who is very passionate in the subject and i would also like to thank sl sir for making such a, an amazing uh, invite for the talk uh, so i would like to uh, begin my uh, uh, talk and i shall share my screen so i hope my screen is visible to everybody uh okay so as the as you must have all seen the invite the title of today's talk is we are all stardust so uh when we speak of stardust naturally we you know we have gravitated towards the idea of astrophysics but before i go into astrophysics uh let me just like put in for like uh, put in front of you an idea of physics Uh, i wouldn't i'm not going to go into detail of uh, all the branches of physics here it's basically i just want to uh, show what part of physics do these stars fall in or do these comprise the entirety of physics the uh, physics roughly can be uh, fitted into this map that you can see on screen here so uh, 
70 to 75 percent of the map is occupied by classical physics and quantum physics one of which is very clear and very very much understandable and the other one uh, is not so as much clear as uh, the other one and for logical reasons we are pursuing quantum physics for uh, all things uh, uh, advanced uh, so uh, astro just like any other science in greek means star so studying the physics of the star is astrophysics irrespective of what all objects we find in astrophysics like uh, black holes or uh, asteroids or meteors or other things everything has some at some point of its life been a part of a star so this is the part and from how do we observe this from earth we observe it via the light that has traveled to earth from them so using telescopes and how do they travel by form of waves so these are all the ideas inside physics that contribute to astrophysics so uh, this red box you see here on screen is basically what astrophysics comprises of ev comprises of everything else is going to be only what falls inside it or how it is being extrapolated so the rest 20% of the screen here that is just for your information because uh, getting into that would mean we will have to basically go through the entire syllabus of our uh, uh, master's program. So moving ahead. Uh, so astrophysics basically falls under this category called popular science and not many uh, uh, people in the field like uh, eminent professors and scientists in the field consider this term popular science flattering because they feel that it reduces the actual value of the subject itself. But it is popular for a reason. And you know, you know, it's very cliche that interesting things are popular and other things are not. But cliches are cliches because they work. So you know, it's, there's got to be some reason why it's popular. Because this is one such subject that has fascinated every one of us at some point in our life. I mean, irrespective of what profession we are in, whether we are a scientist or, a, uh, or an architect or an artist or I don't know, any profession we may take, someday or the other we might have wondered, what's up there in the sky and why do these stars twinkle? So uh, this, and uh, speaking of that, astronomy was the discipline that existed uh, and it's one of the oldest observational science. Whatever has been observed has been observed via astronomy. The data that has been collected from all the objects in the sky and everything. So the sister discipline of astronomy is theoretical astrophysics. Theoretical, the word theoretical here arises because of the invo extensive involvement of mathematics. Because other, uh, uh, and uh, in extensive involvement of mathematics and combining that with uh, physical concepts. So again, this is also going to be based on observed data, except astronomy's observed data is only based on the observed distances and positions of the objects in the sky, while astrophysics uh, observed data will include a lot more uh, physical quantities or aspects such as luminosity, mass, distance, uh, the amount of uh, uh, the density. So all these things will matter when you consider the term astrophysics. So what exactly has been the pursuit of physics as such? So physics as such has always been in the pursuit of uh, getting putting together one solid theory that would explain all the fundamental forces and the fundamental particles that exist. Fundamental forces, you know, being the electromagnetic force, the nuclear force, the weak force, such things. So, and fundamental particles being the electrons, protons, anything that's fundamental, anything, any bigger thing that can be further explained by a smaller thing is, and as smaller as it can get, uh, is the uh, uh, fundamental thing. So, pursuit of physics has been that, to get, get one theory. So, uh, so I, I don't know how many of you watched it, The Theory of Everything by Stephen Hawking. So that basically explains what's the pursuit of physics is. One theory for all. So what has been the pursuit of astrophysics? So pursuit of astrophysics is basically to, it's very close to what the pursuit of physics is, except for physics, it, it also uh, accounts for things on earth and for astrophysics, the rest 80%. Everything else falls to astrophysics. How, how, um, how do we understand the universe? Who are we? Are we alone in the universe? How far is our sun? Where? Uh, how does the light originate from the sun? Why is our sun yellow? Why is the earth the third uh, planet? So all these questions. 
and um, uh, our, uh, how big is our universe so these questions answer the answer to these questions is basically the pursuit of astrophysics so i'm uh, so i'm trying to set a premise here for the rest of my talk where i'll be basically uh, talking about how we were all once a part of a star like quite literally when you stop imagining stars to be those uh, big burning balls of fire it will be possible to actually think that we were once a part of that big burning ball of fire so uh, stars uh, in the simplest explanation was what i just said they are big burning balls of fire so uh, so to those of you who are familiar with uh, the krypton planet you we all know that you, there is a, there's this thing called a red sun so obviously that's a star and and it's not yellow so that itself is proof enough that there are stars that are not yellow and they do exist so no, these non yellow stars why are they yellow and uh, what uh, what is the reason they exist in different colors is it because they are all different entirely with respect to each other or are they just in different stages of their lifetime so for uh, to answer this what we need to consider is the temperature of these stars uh with you know how we see in a flame the outermost uh, part of a flame is yellow and the innermost part is blue and uh, similarly the temperature determines somewhat determines the uh, i wouldn't say somewhat temperature partly determines the colors of color of a star and the color as such is also determined by one other thing uh, which is the composition of the star about which I'll, i'll i'll come later so uh, for example if you see some familiar stars that we know from day to day life that when we look up at the sky and we're like oh that's the north northern star that's sirius that that's betelgeuse that's the sun when we say such things um have you ever wondered like have you ever stopped to wonder what color are these stars different in color see when we see from down here when we look up everything probably seems just yellow but just pay like a few more minutes of attention and you will see that all of them are not yellow for example if you consistently watch or if you're a star gazer you will see that the venus you can see the venus during evening times and it's not always uh, you know white in color it's not always twink, uh, it's it's sometimes orangish so similarly when you when you see the sirius or the rigel or the polaris or the sun alpha centauri proxima centauri betelgeuse so betelgeuse is a primarily a red color star that obviously uh, doesn't catch our eye uh, but is uh, but does exist as a red color star so the only star that's yellow from what we observe every day is the sun so this is this is due to the different temperatures of these stars at different temperatures they burn differently and due to the heat generator they become luminous anything that burns at some point becomes luminous and the second part of why they their color comes out is what we'll see next so uh, the composition of a star also matters very much for uh, uh, what color it um, shows or what color uh, it basically burns in so if you all if uh, you could remember your experiments from 12th standard you know chemistry experiments where we did flame tests uh, and we used to record this observation called as uh, characteristic burning or characteristic color of flame of barium of calcium of sodium so all these things burned in different colors like brick red yellow and orange so such things also those are things that can be literally extrapolated to out of the world they can be extrapolated extrapolated out of the world so and also the temperature of the star or how bright it burns or how big it is all depends upon which stage of its life it is in which stage of the life uh, the star exists in so uh, while finishing this i'll tell you how we are all made up of stars so what this uh, uh, how is a star uh, basically born so uh, consider like a uh, uh, take into account a few blobs of hydrogen gas though that that's just existing uh, and floating away in the uh, infinite space or vacuum so close by hydrogen uh, hydrogen blobs of gas due to gravitational uh, pull and attraction because they are close to each other form small uh, nebulae so that's called the this giant gas cloud or the nebula 
so those form together to form uh, those come together to form this one larger cloud of hydrogen gas and what happens to that hydrogen gas is slowly uh, the outward gravitational pressure uh, makes the star uh, uh, exerts a lot more pressure into the star and uh, basically uh, crushes it so that what happens then is you you get something that burns when a lot of pressure is applied there is a, there is going to be a lot of heat that's going to be generated and uh, the relative temperature of the, the star as the nebulae and a protostar protostar is nothing but a lot of protons coming together and because of the uh, crushing effect of the gravitational pressure from outside they have they are becoming denser and denser together and they are glowing now and what happens after they uh, uh, become uh, more, much more denser blob of hydrogen gas is that uh, they start fusing together because of the uh, because of the pressure exerted from outside and at one point what happens is all the electrons from the outer ring of the of, of, from the outer surface of the atom of outer surface as in electron shells are going to be the uh, last shells inside an atom so what happens due to this enormous pressure is they all st start to fall inside they all start falling inside and due to this due to this extremely high energy is generated and thus they also start burning so after this these protons start also colliding with, with each other with such high velocity and thus the core of a star is formed so eventually what happens is this core also exerts an outward pressure called the nuclear pressure and there is also an inward pressure which is the gravitational pressure so due to both of these pressures the because of which there is going to be extremely high energy this uh, hydrogen uh, is going this uh, blobs of hydrogen or protons are going to be fused together with each other which will eventually form the uh, helium which will eventually form helium so now you have uh, uh, helium and hydrogen in different quantities inside a star what happens after this is these stars start burning and burning and you know this fusion keep con constantly takes place it's a chain reaction so and the energy is constantly being generated this is the form in which the energy will be generated and there will be a stage where uh, it's going to get exhausted right it's not going to be it's not going to run forever so when it's burning at its prime which is going to be the 99% of the life of the star that will be our yellow sun or the red yellow to orange these two variations are going to be the uh, something called as the main sequence stars so these are what uh, determine what the star is going to end up as the mass created in a star right now at this stage will determine whether what the star will end up as whether as a black hole or something else so after this is what uh, uh, leads to the aging stage of a star which is the red giant that is when the star runs out of hydrogen fuel that is when the star runs out of hydrogen that only helium exists so at that time the temperature is going to naturally drop because the amount of fusion happening is has reduced and there is only helium there so this leads to the star burning bright red beetle gaze you know why now you know why we call beetle gaze as a dying star so depending upon whether if the star is a relatively low mass it will be a red giant if it's going to be an extremely high mass star high mass and low mass are relative terms so low mass is something that's comparable to the mass of our sun and high mass stars are things that are uh, mass to up to 10 to 15 times the mass of our sun these are like high mass stars so that are going to burn like uh, extremely uh, uh, they become red super giants basically so after this the death of a star that's that that is determined as such what happens is now the gravitational pressure from outside uh, makes helium nuclei fuse together so now what happens hydrogen uh, protons became hydrogen and hydrogen became helium so hydrogen is at uh, atomic number 1 helium is atomic number 2 when helium fused helium fuses together we get carbon and further on and then you get nitrogen so this work was actually done by hans bethe and he was even uh, awarded the nobel prize for this for determining the nuclear reaction that's taking place in the stars so so when this keeps progressing what happens is in the core of a star uh, now you, as you can see the temperature of the star has started to reduce so after this what happens is the core of a star starts to cool down because there is not enough nuclear pressure outwards and only gravitational pressure inwards and there can't be any more uh, crushing happening 
because of the loss of energy it's it's all getting cooled down and the uh, cooled down parts of a star are uh, drifting away from the body of it so now you have gotten you, you uh, the heaviest element that is found inside a star uh, that is formed inside the core of a star is iron so this happens and then what happens is the uh, for a low mass star as i said comparable to the mass of a sun it uh, uh, forms a white dwarf or, or a black dwarf and for a really heavy mass star it forms a neutron star or a black hole so this neutron star or black holes are formed when this aging star like almost dead star finally gives into this gravitational pressure and finally collapses like that uh, extremely high density collapses in together and that creates this huge explosion so when this explosion takes place it either becomes a neutron star or a black hole and spinning neutron stars when neutron stars are spinning around so those are also called as pulsars okay so this is the fundamental idea of how elements as such are formed in stars none of the element we find on earth are, have have been naturally occurring on earth those were once a, like at some point in their life they were a part of a star so uh, this this is called the hr diagram which basically explains uh, the different colors or different uh, temperatures of a star and it uh, it's been plotted by the hr stands for hertzsprung russell and this is uh, uh, this is plotted to get an idea of where or what classification of stars exist and you can understand it from the diagram on the left and right side is just a gross comparison between what we have as a uh, comparison of stars with how bright we as people are so planets are you as you, this this small box here this box is this box everything else other than this box is things that are given for comparative study so uh the lightning bolt or the planets all of these things are very very much much less brighter than the stars that we can find so this image here you can see the primary elements that are found in our body which includes obviously oxygen carbon hydrogen nitrogen calcium etc yeah so all these things are basically found in our body and like i how i explained in the how uh, in the life of a star these elements uh, were once born as a part of a star and now these elements comprise us as human beings or any any other living being so this this can only tell us that we have all at some point in our life definitely been a part of a star so this is when you know this this uh, the title of this talk is definitely uh, very scientifically intriguing and very philosophical but it is 100% the truth so the one thing that can uh, one question that uh, mainly arises now after i said that uh, uh, blobs of hydrogen or blobs of proton came together to form a nebula and then they formed protostars and blah 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 all these things so what the question can now arise is okay the elements came from these stars but where did the first proton or the first hydrogen come from so that is what is explained by the concept of big bang theory so big bang theory is one of those uh, models or the theories that explains the origin of the universe but contrary to popular belief that's not the only theory that exists to explain how the universe began or how the universe uh, or where it started from because according to the big bang theory the universe was born approximately 14 billion years ago but you know in in the early 21st century uh, astronomers discovered a star or a star system that was more than uh, 16 to 18 billion years away so if you can find a star that's 18 billion years away obviously the universe was born before that so the big bang theory is not the absolute truth so there is another theory called the hoyle narlikar theory which was again put uh, put forward as the opponent to big bang theory if i may say so uh, so what this theory states is that there has been no singular beginning or end to the universe it the universe has just been ever existing so there are very small small big bangs happening here uh, around the universe which has given birth to these hydrogen clouds but there is no definitive time when the universe was born so these two are very uh, uh, the second one can also be you know it's in line with the steady state theory steady state is like quite uh, as uh, uh, if you take the meaning as directly as it means steady state that which means that the universe has been steady and it's been existing ever since and you never know and none of us know when it started so this basically gives us an idea of what the cosmological model or the uh, uh, theory of the universe that existed 
and uh, moving along. Uh, so the discovery of heavier elements in stars. So I told you about elements until iron that existed in stars. So iron is like a fairly early element in the periodic table. We have elements that, that have existed till like uranium, technetium, all these radioactive elements, uh, unenpentium, unenceptium, all these extremely heavy elements. So how are these elements born? The same procedure when the star uh, happened to have uh, iron in its core, uh, what happened, there is this process that took place called the electron capture. Like I'm sure all of you are familiar with the word fusion, hydrogen fusion or nuclear fusion, which gives rise to this uh, idea of the burning of stars. So there is another process called the electron capture where uh, what happens is uh, uh, when the density becomes so high, when the density as such, as in not the density of a particular atom, but the density of the entire star becomes so high, uh, uh, what happens and what, what happens is the uh, protons inside an atom start acquiring the electrons in its outermost shells and uh, he heavier and heavier elements were formed. So until the 1950s, uh, people only knew about iron being formed in the stars or some basic elements being formed. So post that, what happened was in 2000 or 2001, Paul Merrill, uh, so this, uh, astro uh, this astrophysicist, he discovered uh, uh, traces of technetium in the spectra that he saw through his telescope. So technetium is a fairly heavy element. So when he saw that, he immediately got to work and, you know, studied the fact and uh, why these heavier elements were formed. And that gave rise to this entire idea of stellar nucleosynthesis. So stellar nucleosynthesis, it's basically just three words. Stellar means anything star or anything that burns bright in the sky, pulsars, neutron stars. So stellar, nucleo as in a nuclear reaction. Synthesis is basically something that's being done. So stellar nucleosynthesis. This was born after Paul Merrill discovered technetium as a part of the spectra he observed in the, through his telescope. And then recently, you know, in the last year, uh, uh, Professor Arun Aruna Goswami from the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, even, uh, uh, con uh, I wouldn't uh, say confirmed exactly, but uh, she and her group of students, uh, doctoral students, also worked on uh, dis uh, discovering heavier elements uh, from a carbon reaction, which basically, uh, 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 what do I say? complements the work of Paul Merrill or uh, is, uh, at, uh, is something that agrees with his work and it's a recent discovery. So this, these are some things that tell us that we, uh, we were and we are basically stardust and existing with you know different forms of stardust or different uh, shapes and different sizes and different functions of stardust. So uh, some, you know, for when we say astrophysics, we tend to constantly think about people like uh, Stephen Hawking or uh, the, that's the first name that arises, obviously. And obviously, due credit to him, uh, all these people have done some great work. But there have been some really amazing astrophysicists from India, uh, some of whom I have mentioned here. So, Professor M. N. Saha, he was the man behind the uh, proposal or discovery of uh, the nuclear reactions taking pl taking place inside a star, and uh, I I think you must remember this uh, Hoyle Narlikar theory here. So the Narlikar from that theory is Professor J V Narlikar, who was the uh, who who is the founder of IUCA, which is the Inter University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, and uh, so. Uh, after that, you have Professor Govind Sorup, who is deemed as the father of radio astronomy in India, and he was the founder of the National Center for Radio Astrophysics. And Professor T. Padmanabhan, he was one of the one of the most eminent uh, theoretical astrophysicists and cosmologists from here. And uh, Professor Joydeep Bakshi, he set up the radio physics lab at Ayuka with Professor Balchandra Joshi, and he also is the man behind uh, the discovery of the supercluster Saraswati. So these are some notable Indian astrophysicists because when we think about a subject that we're very passionate about, we look for people just like how we look, look at celebrities. When you, you know, when you're passionate about something, you look for celebrities in that field. So these people are basically the celebrities of astrophysics, I would say. So, and, uh, and I'm, I, I'm also like really happy that at some point in my student life, I got to meet like uh, three of the people mentioned here. 
so that's been i would say that's been one of my greatest uh, achievements meeting the celebrities of this field so uh, i i from like this point on what i i would like to do is basically uh, talk to you about how i personally got into the field of astrophysics and uh, for the students present here or anyone else who wishes to pursue a career in this subject i would like to you know give an idea of what exists or what doesn't exist how we can proceed from uh, where we are right now and uh, basically i wouldn't say career advice i'm just putting forward the kind of places that are available in india to pursue this thing, pursue this as a subject or as a career so my uh, uh, liking towards physics started in 10th standard credit to my physics teacher high school physics teacher so this happened uh, 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 like in the middle of when i was in uh, when i was in the middle of getting interested in physics the discovery of the higgs boson was announced and it was termed as the god particle which uh, which later when you, you know when i came to the ug studying bsc physics i got to realize that the why it was called god particle was the, the reason was none other than uh, because it was the uh, the idea of discovering the god particle was so uh, was highly highly negligible that when it was found it was a thing to celebrate about and the uh, science journalist or the person who wrote the science article for the higgs boson discovery basically termed it as the goddamn particle and from that it started to be known as god particle so it's a funny story there so uh, post this so this happened in uh, my 9th and 10th standard so after that i uh, there was this uh, olympiad or national exam that was announced in our school which was called the, so all of this happened you know on a day to day basis you never realize that you're getting into the subject unless you're consciously putting effort so and and i'm i'm pretty sure until school time most of us are like that we barely know what we're interested in but before that we are pushed into something that we could you know we might probably be interested in and we might probably excel in so this this because until 10th before 10th standard if you had asked me i would have said that i wanted to uh, pursue i wanted i wanted to study graphic designing or game developing or i want to become an automobile engineer see these are pretty understandable dreams for a, uh, for a girl who was basically who basically spent a lot of her time playing need for speed but post that tense that happened and i got interested in physics and then this discovery happened and i got really interested i started reading up articles and all these things so this nsea i wrote this exam called the national standard examination in astrophysics so this exam is conducted throughout india uh, by the homi baba center and this is a preliminary exam to shortlist people or students to uh, take part in the international astrophysical olympiad you know basically to represent india so for that a lot of you know uh, shortlisting procedures take place uh, so the starting stage of that was the nsea so uh, like obviously i, I it's not like uh, that's the only way you can get into the subject it's just one of the ways in which you can get interested in it so i wrote that i didn't clear it but while studying the materials for this exam that showed to me a lot more uh, avenues in astrophysics that i could possibly as a high school, high school student understand because when you try to study this uh, theory of everything or uh, 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 stephen hawking's works or einstein's paper when you are in high school it doesn't or most of those things don't make a lot of sense but you want it to make sense but the only astrophysics that made sense was the one that i found in marvel so uh, post that my uh, trist with physics continuous trist with physics happened which has been, which is continuing till date so i did my undergraduate in physics psc physics from maitras college chennai so in my first year i also along with being interested in astrophysics i have also been extremely interested in studying the positions of stars and what they mean and the, their role in indian astronomy and so that's basically what got me into attending the course offered by varaha meera science forum so when gopu uh, when gopu sir was teaching us about uh, the indian astronomy of uh, aryabhatta varaha meera bhaskaracharya all these people so that's something that immensely interests me so uh, in my first year i did a case study paper on aryabhatiyam uh, aryabhatiyam is the work of aryabhatta on uh, astronomical objects and uh, 
studies based on that. Uh, so uh, this case study was basically on the fact that Copernicus wasn't the first one to claim that uh, the uh, our solar system was heliocentric. Heliocentric, helios as in sun and centric as in center. Our solar system revolved around the sun. So uh, in my case study, I claim that Copernicus wasn't the first one, but thousand years before Copernicus, when Aryabhata wrote Aryabhatiyam, there are proofs of the idea of heliocentric theory existing there. So Indian astronomy has uh, been the pioneer in this area too. So this is the outline of my paper at paper on this. Uh, Arya Bhattiyam and I got to present this paper at the international conference organized by Etheraj College and the Arya Bhatta Institute of uh, Astronomical Sciences in 2017. This was in my first year. So, uh, so in my undergraduation, one of my uh, former HOD, uh, so my HOD ma'am was the reason behind why I could consistently be passionate about the subject. Because when in the beginning stages of being passionate about a subject, when you're not given enough opportunities, you tend to lose interest, right? So I was great. I was like uh, fortunate enough to constantly get support from my teachers in school and my HOD ma'am from uh, former HOD ma'am from Aitaraj College and uh, so uh, moving ahead. So after this, I got I uh, uh, got to know about a lot of these uh, uh, astrophysics or astronomy training programs and such from uh, Dr. Uttra Doreraj, and you can find she's a very uh, eminent uh, science communication professor. Uh, I mean, she's a physics professor, obviously, but she's been in the field of science communication. And through her, I got to know about a lot of opportunities available for students in astrophysics. So most of my knowledge in this comes from uh, whatever I could uh, learn from her. So I attended the and got trained from the radio astronomy winter school in 2017, which was organized by Ayuka and NCRA. And after that, I got selected as, I got to work as the summer research fellow at the Indian Academy of Sciences at the International Center for Theoretical Sciences, Bangalore. Uh, I, so I basically worked on low mass X-ray binaries, studying the accretion disk of a specific given low mass X-ray binary. So I'll also get to the part where you can download publicly available astronomical data and work as independent astronomers. It's not that you have to belong to an organization to you know nurture your passion for the subject. So post this, one thing I realized whenever I went to any summer school or this winter school was that any, or the other students who came there were always very fondly or very uh, usefully talked about the astronomy clubs that existed at their college. So what I figured was that kind, that kind of a science club did not exist in our college. And I really wanted to, you know, get this thing, get this idea of astrophysics being a subject and a possible career in it to other students who might be interested. And, you know, in general, also astronomy is a subject that interests almost everybody. So I went, I uh, went ahead to, you know, establish the astronomy club of Etheraj College in 2018 and got its affiliation from uh, Vignan Prasar which is an autonomous institution under the DS Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. So this is these are the pictures that I mentioned previously where I, I have pictures with, uh, you know, celebrities in astrophysics. So the left picture is a picture of Professor Narlikar and Professor Mangla Narlikar. Uh, so this was taken at uh, GLA University, Mathura, at a workshop sponsored by Ayuka on cosmology. So on the right side picture, I do... I am there in this photo, just that not, none of you can see it. I'm somewhere in the back. So this is a photo of Professor Gobind Swaroop, father, father of radio astronomy. Uh, so, and this is a picture, this person right here is Professor Joydeep Bakchi, who was, who discovered the Saraswati, uh, 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 you know, the cluster, Saraswati clusters. And he also, he was the one who set up the radio physics lab at NCRA. So these are some pictures uh, that I would really like to show, you know, given this opportunity, I thought I might share it with you. And so, and this is a picture where we went and visited this uh, giant meter wave radio telescope in Pune. Uh, so this is one of the world's largest telescopes that uh, measures uh, uh, wavelengths in centimeters. That is the telescopes out of the telescopes, which measure wavelengths in centimeters, GMRT is the largest. You know, usually when we talk about wavelengths, it's always in nanometers or Armstrong's 10 to the power of minus 9, 10 to the power of minus 10. But GMRT is a telescope which measures wavelength 
of 21 centimeters, which is basically the hydrogen's uh, line spectra uh, in technical terms. So post my BSc, I got into the physics uh, masters of physics program at VIT Velu, and VIT Velu offered me opened another entire like plethora of gates to pursue this as as uh, uh, a career. So in at, at VIT, I got to work on multiple projects. Uh, which involved studying the density profile of Bose Einstein condensate as dark uh, Bose Einstein condensate as a possible candidate for dark matter. And I studied about the matter wave solitons and dark energy and the formation of Bose and stable Bose Einstein condensates using PT symmetry. And I also processed the data uh, from Kepler 2 mission. Uh, so there's Kepler 1 mission and Kepler 2 mission and studied the planetary systems of Aquarius. Aquarius is one of the constellations that you can find. And I got to attend a workshop sponsored by Ayuka in Mathura on cosmology, the picture that you saw previously. So finally, I worked on my master's thesis work on gravitational wave astronomy from IIT Madras. So astrophysics is not just one subject as such. It's, uh, you know, once you get into the subject, you see that there are multiple branches inside astrophysics itself. One of which is gravitational wave astronomy. And then you have pulsar astrophysics, and then you have X-ray astrophysics, so there are like multiple branches of it naturally because the deeper you go uh, the narrower it gets but obviously it's going to get a lot more intense so now uh, after like this is the idea i wanted to give you so that you can uh, uh, like uh, to show you that when you look for the opportunity in the right place you do get those uh, because most times as a ug student i found that we have to go in search of things that we want more than what comes to us. What comes to us is, is what goes to everybody. And sometimes we may not be interested. I mean, it, it's it's very much possible that we could be interested. But in case, if you want to find out what you're interested in, the best way is to pursue everything. And to pursue everything, you have to go around and look for things that, that are there to pursue. So uh, pursue a career in astrophysics starting from high school. So the first thing that you could do is, you know, read up science articles in newspapers, read the last page of the uh, uh, newspaper and that's just to get you interested and after that uh, uh, as a, in high school you can write the NSEA exam and at college level the best idea is you know to do uh, science communication I would say because science communication is science communication networking is the best way to further yourself in uh, any field of science because once you uh, know who are all working in what all fields and how you can equip yourself in order to pursue something in that field, then there is really no stopping you because whatever you uh, find, you will naturally be interested and you will not feel that it's a waste of time and you might, you know, there is no loss. You can check it out. You just apply and if you get through well and good, if you don't get through, you, you always have backup options. So that's what science communication helps us with. It, it really helps us collaborate. So at college level, I would suggest that from what I have done is uh, explore different fellowships and internships. Don't re restrict yourself to this is what you want to do before you know what all are there. And then work with scientists and professors who match your areas of interest. Don't, never ever really think that you're not eligible because when you look at people in the media, scientific media even though, there are, there are people who have achieved a lot and then they are there. When we look at them in the starting point of our career, what we feel is maybe we are not eligible enough to apply to places. It's never the case. It's really, trust me, it's never the case because what people want is how interested you are in the subject because anybody can get into the subject. But what matters is how far you can, you know, put through the, how far you can hold up, basically. So another very exciting part about working in astrophysics is getting to work at observatories because our laboratory is the sky. It's, it is, it's not restricted to the four walls. And uh, the, I, I suggest there's, there's definitely going to be a lot of self-learning because uh, starting off, it's not a subject that's being taught every day in classrooms. What we study is physics as a whole and astrophysics may comprise a chapter, that's all. So self-learning of the subject will definitely give you an edge over other people who may not be pursuing a specific subjects uh, when they are looking for something to pursue. So, and now post your PG level, at PG level, you can't really specialize in astrophysics because for astrophysics, it's basically an amalgamation of all the subjects that you 
all the subjects in physics i mean all the subjects in physics that uh, put together or com uh, uh, comprise uh, to explain the stars is what astrophysics is so but in the pg level there are uh, two options where you can pursue pg in physics itself again to get a better and advanced understanding of as uh, physics and then pursue to astrophysics but you could also study astronomy or astrophysics specific courses at pg level so which uh, is being offered in a lot of place which is being offered in a couple of places in india so but mostly studying physics on the masters level is again you know better because once you start studying astrophysics they are anyway going to teach you physics and only if you can take up that much pressure within 2 years you will be good otherwise you lose the you lose both the passion for the subject and the course which is not what we want obviously so then we go to the list of introductory or training programs in astronomy or astrophysics for ug and pg level students and uh, so this involves the radio astronomy winter school uh, radio astronomy is basically the study of the radio waves that come from outer space and not just the optical waves optical waves is anything we can see radio waves is something that we don't see but definitely exists so the radio astronomy winter school at ayuka and ncra and the summer school on introductory introduction to astronomy and astrophysics by ayuka again and there is another there are like three more so indian institute of astrophysics also offers a summer school on astrophysics and then icts bangalore offers the sn but memorial fellowship and then there is also this annual lecture program which uh, icts hosts for astrophysics uh, so one of which i was able to attend in 2018 as a part of my program which was uh, hosted by uh, professor g shrinivasan uh, emeritus professor emeritus professor from raman research institute uh, so these pro these programs basically help you equip yourself to the subject that's coming ahead so and then post this you have the fellowships and internships the first one was introductory and training programs after that you have the fellowships and internships because uh, for fellowships and internships you need a certain skill set which the professors might expect uh, when they want to give you a project to work on because obviously they don't want uh, to train somebody from scratch at the same time they do want to train you in their area so it's uh, uh, it's it's the right you need to find the right balance of it so there are like multiple visiting student research programs at ayuka ncra tifr icts iia aries aries is the aryabhatta research institute in nainital and then one uh, major summer research fellowship program uh, that's offered throughout india I and mean, everything else is also offered throughout india but this is something that that's very very uh, well known and very important too i would say for every ug or pg student is the summer research fellowship program this is sponsored by the indian academy of sciences bangalore national academy of sciences delhi and the international science academy in allahabad so this is one program that you can apply to and uh, you will be given uh, you you will be assigned a professor as a, your supervisor and you can go there and work so this all these things help you build your network so when you finally become a scientist your network matters more than what work you do because if nobody knows you whatever work you do you may do may not end up getting the right kind of attention it needs so the i would say networking and science communication are equal as equally as important as the subject that you are pursuing and then post this you have the phd program specific in astrophysics and also in physics a lot of physics physics uh, phd physics programs also have astrophysics uh, ideas but i have only mentioned the astrophysics programs here so you can also apply to any physics programs also so the one of the main programs that uh, phd programs offered are the uh, indian institute of astrophysics in collaboration with pondicherry university offers its phd program and then ayuka offers its program uh, phd program by means of uh, there are three ways in, through, through which you can get into that program one is through inat inat is basically the entrance test for ayuka and that the this is one of the program that you know that really gets me excited excited and i aspire for which is the joint astronomy and astrophysics program offered by iisc bangalore so this program basically lets you uh, uh, learn from all the institutes in bangalore 
which is basically uh, Indian Institute of Science, Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Raman Research Institute, ICTS, TIFR. So all these places to get you get to learn from all these places together as a part of your PhD program, and so these are the exams that you might you will have to clear to get into a physics PhD program in India. So these are the national level entrance exams. This test exam is specific only to physics and computer science students, while the NET and GATE exams are open for all the other subject students too. But obviously, since we are only talking about astrophysics, all, you will need all these four, you know, to keep your app options open. And so now this is one exciting thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, this is the like uh, gross list of all the institutes in India that offer astronomy and astrophysics programs, and also a list of a couple of observatories. So maybe you can save this slide, or this may also be later available in the website. I think so. If you see in this map, this is like one very exciting map. India plays host to two of Asia's largest telescopes, first and second. So that's something to be really proud about, I think. So these are the uh, you know observatories in India that exist, and we've got some. We've got all our observatories in such scenic locations. Like most pictures you see online, where you think they are mostly photoshopped or some uh, uh, random person taking a picture from the aurora borealis from. near the arctic that's actually not true if you see the image of the milky way from near the hanley observatory they are all pretty mind blowing like this is a, an actual picture of the hanley observatory in ladakh it is a part of the indian institute of astrophysics and this is like really cool when you can get such naked eye views it's going to be brilliant you know this is what keeps any astronomer going and this is the devasthal aries telescope and it's the world's largest optical telescope and this is gmrt which is the world's largest telescope operating at centimeter length and this is the vainupappu observatory so prior to when the devasthal telescope in a by aries was uh, established the vainupappu observatory was the uh, was the asia's largest telescope so this is very close to us from chennai it's like only 3 hours from chennai and this uh, this also again is a part of the indian institute of astrophysics and uh, so for people who wish to pursue astrophysics individually before you may get into any program you have data of satellites basically satellite data of all the stars and pulsars and black holes and all these things available online for free like you don't have to pay anything you know you read this this news in the paper where the software engineer discovered a crater in the moon the seven standard boy uh, discovered a star so all these things are actually pretty simple when you can you can download this data from places such as the astrosat which is basically india satellite and then you have the nasa's open data portal which basically gives you access to all published uh, nasa missions data and then you have the kepler missions so i made use of this kepler mission data to study the uh, uh, planetary systems of aquarius even if you know even if you don't want to pursue a project as such you could just you know process this data and see how we are looking at stars we look at stars on our laptop as numbers they they don't appear twinkling those are not images so these are something that you know uh, that are very uh, in the simplest of terms very interesting but these are something that those are astronomical so uh, uh tools i suggest are very much necessary for people wanting to pursue astrophysics is first to learn how to work in a linux environment and the best way to simultaneously learn to work in a linux environment and use astronomy tools is the fedora astronomy suit it's simple it's free it's uh, available on fedora's website and you can download it just make sure you have proper compatibility issues and everything and if you are somebody who codes and then you might be you might want to familiarize familiarize yourself with these three libraries astropy numpy and scipy and then learn about light curve plots light curve plots are basically luminosity plots uh, and then rgb filters rgb filters are, are to study the image image as such and to process image you know when you process the data using rgb filters you get to see an actual picture of the crab nebula so that is going to be worth it when you finally finish it so like i mentioned before how important science communication is this is uh, an image that ba basically gives you an idea of how important uh, science communication can be 
uh, between scientists science there are, there are different types of scientific science communication uh, among scientists between scientists and science journalists and between scientists and pr uh, public relations or press officers so public relations or press officers basically come into play when you are working for r and d industries so this are uh, other the idea about science communication and for uh, learning about astrophysics you know self learning ideas uh, these are some books that i have uh, like you know uh, learned from so the book by vaidyanath basu is an extensive and fairly simple for beginners and uh, the astrophysics for physicists by arnab rai choudhury is again a really good book and it's very much understandable by ug students so and by professor t padmanabhan theoretical astrophysics this is a fairly advanced book which you may want to consider when you are in your masters and these are some fun books that you can study or read from when if you just you know want to get uh, a conversation making idea of astrophysics when you meet someone who is into astrophysics and you want to make conversation with regards to astrophysics you might want to have read these books so and these are some you know astronomy apps that you can download and get the view of the sky so yeah that's it thank you guys thank you for patiently listening to me hope this was useful so my the idea of this talk by me was you know as a student from my understanding of astrophysics that i have put forward and obviously there are much more eminent and uh, established professors and scientists from whom you can learn the subject authentically my job here was to get you to google them basically so thank you um thank you thank you deepthi uh, but you know our intention is to learn from you uh, right now so can you uh, just close or uh, stop sharing so we yes, can sir. have a brief question and answer session thank you um so let's let's start learning from you again there is there's a lot of a uh, uh, whole bunch of interesting facts that you provided uh, i want to break this uh, the q and a session into three parts right first part is to focus on you and how uh, which you talked about uh, the later half of uh, your uh, uh, presentation so you talked about um, school where the interest in uh, uh, you know uh, astrophysics or cosmology or uh, astronomy about stars etc that started right and then you pursued it uh then yeah. you got a lot of opportunities through your undergraduate program yeah then you started pursuing it uh, uh in your postgraduate program and hopefully you know you will probably get into doing a phd so we will we'll find out more about that right what was a point at which uh you uh, started getting into the uh, depths of it as opposed to merely the popular side of it see if you look at a lot of children they will talk about without knowing much about it they will say black holes uh, neutron stars and they will talk about what happens you know black holes will swallow everything these are fun stuff right but astrophysics is not just this set of fun facts fun stuff yeah so when did it really uh, become a serious point for you where you started learning something solid much more than what you will find in a popular book where you really understood uh, that this whole field is a serious scientific study what was that point yeah so the it I, it was not a singular it was not a single day where the turning point occurred where i was no but still you will you will remember you will yes, remember yes, yeah. one yeah, particular yeah, yeah. point yeah. so the thing is uh, it was a gradual process which started in my uh, second year um uh, in ug so after i got uh, selected for the winter school at ayuka mm -hmm. i i figured that actually by that time i really didn't know how um, uh, what a big thing getting into ayuka was so mm -hmm. i i mean i have i had already presented a paper in an international conference and i was really interested and that's probably what got me into writing a good statement of purpose to get selected for it so okay. but i got in there i saw people at ayuka who were actually into stuff you know until that time i could uh, uh, talk to people about black holes and neutron stars and uh, uh, the fascinating part of astrophysics but one post 
or during the winter school you know in those 10 days uh, we had lectures in the mornings and experiments in the evenings and literally 24 7 was spent talking about what astrophysics was and i realized that there is much more to it than literally what just meets the eye so what meets the eye is what meets the eye but you need to know what it is so the depth of the subject i got to understand in the 10 days i spent there i would say okay you know this is really important uh, in uh, uh, my opinion because just reading popular science books will give uh, you know give a lot of buzzwords but our understanding really comes when we are uh, seriously listening to lectures looking at equations getting into you know some experiments etc so i would like to talk about some of the experiments that you were involved in Okay. What were you doing? Just pick two of them. What were you actually doing? What kind of data were you gathering? And what insights uh, did that give you? Just tell us about two experiments. Yeah, yeah. So one of the experiments I remember very clearly was uh, an experiment uh, studying the hydrogen line emission from hydrogen clouds. So we uh, let's take a break and explain to us a little bit more about. Don't make any assumptions about what we will know. What right, we know. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go into what is this hydrogen line? Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this hydrogen line or hydrogen, you know, you have clouds in space. Like how I in the in the beginning of the presentation I mentioned that uh, blobs of hydrogen gas come together to form a protostar, and gravitational pressure makes it more dense and all these things. So. Right. So, okay, if I may, if I may say this, your star is mostly hydrogen. That yeah. much we can say. What is this hydrogen line? Hydrogen line is, see, when you observe a star or when you observe any luminous object, you hmm. get what is called a spectrum. Okay. So, uh, basically, the frequency of the uh, light that is coming from that star. Yep. Uh, which is what I would call, I mean, there will be multiple frequencies. And let us say that that is what the hydrogen... Uh, spectrum yes. is that you are getting yeah okay yes, yes. then what so, happens so that spectrum tells you at what frequency or which color it's it's the most brightest in so okay. uh, this hydrogen line is the frequency of this is 1420 hertz and okay. this was uh, this can be observed using a radio telescope which is basically a dish antenna you know okay how for tv we have these dishes in our tel uh, terrace which grasps the uh, or which uh, gets the uh, frequency from TV stations to our houses, right? Okay. So that is essentially a radio telescope only. You can okay. use it as a radio telescope and get the uh, readings of the sun. So that, that's, but that on a larger scale gets you to, uh, you know, observe the hydrogen clouds in the uh, space. Okay. So you, uh, you know, you, what experiments were you doing? So this was one experiment where we uh, got data from hydrogen clouds near what, whichever object that we were pointing our telescope towards. Okay. Uh, near Orion, near the Orion Nebula or near other constellations. So we did this and we got some data, we plotted it. So that was one point where I realized that um, quantifying your interest, you know, makes a lot of difference. Right. You quantifying your interest when you start plotting graphs and deriving equations just to look at stars that will tell you and if you still want to pursue it that will tell you if you're really interested when you okay. start wanting to pursue it by the time you plot graphs for stars then that means you probably are just interested in the popular part of it okay so this is one experiment tell us about one more experiment so another experiment was uh, um, we built, we actually built the radio telescope there. We uh, like okay. the dishes, the you know, the airtel and data sky dishes we have at home. So Correct. this and the satellite detector and uh, a multimeter and uh, connecting wires and FK, uh, you know, those F cables you have plugged in behind your setup box. These cables, mm -hmm. we, we basically built a radio telescope and uh, that was one of the again experiments we had. And, uh, so, so what you are saying is that with what is available uh, at home with all these dish antenna and little bits of things that you can go and buy in Ritchie Street in Chennai, yes. you can put together a radio telescope all by yourself. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Can you can you do something for us? 
can you just put together uh, a note on how to build a radio telescope and we will put it up in our uh, website and yes, we will encourage people to build it and you can also tell us what we can uh, you know what a student you know schools can actually get involved in this you know build a radio telescope themselves collect information and make sense of it okay yeah. this will be nice so it will probably take us a long time now but let us uh, let us uh, you know we'll come back to you get the material with uh, pictures in terms of how to go about putting this together and we'll publish it mm-hmm. so fantastic so one is that collecting real time data about uh, a star and then plotting and then trying to get something out of that was a great uh, uh, you know jump for you next is building a radio telescope itself that's that's fantastic super okay uh, now let's let's uh, jump up to your uh, you know i i won't take too much time about your own uh, uh, work but couple of questions what was that uh, masters thesis that you worked on and what kind of uh, uh, you know subject were you looking to study and what was the conclusion okay so my masters thesis was uh, basically in the field of gravitation wave astronomy and mm-hmm. it was in the field i consciously selected you know um, i was interested i would say every time somebody asked me what are you interested in until school i used to say it's physics post that i started saying astrophysics and post mm-hmm. second year or third year or even msc i am still interested in astrophysics as a broader area okay the point now is that astrophysics has become a broad area for me until then right. it, it was a narrower part of physics but now astrophysics has become a broad area in which i i i had to you know figure out which part i was interested in and uh, i was open to working in anything that involved me studying stars or anything outside mm-hmm. right? so i got to uh, it was covid time and i i had to you know resort to working on something theoretical theoretical astrophysics although my prime okay. lies with observational i actually started to like this uh, theoretical side of it my work was uh, basically on um, in 2017 if you all remember the nobel prize was given to uh, kip thorn and uh, two other scientists for the discovery of gravitational waves which was the mm-hmm. proof of einstein's theory 100 experimental proof of einstein's theory 100 years after he has proposed it so this uh, uh, we're talking of which you know let me just ask the question now and you can answer this uh in a sense they were uh, measuring the gravitational waves the proposal that there will be a gravitational wave which is just the you know created by the space time uh, 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 you know continuum, uh, continuum uh, caused by the uh, uh, you know big bang in a sense no, no, right no no no, uh, no it's not caused by the big bang actually big bang it's not you know a theory that's 100% correct now because you know okay. we- stars that are that date before the big bang big bang was theorized to have to have happened like 14 billion years ago we have stars that have been observed that a, who's who are like 18 18 billion years away so obviously big bang was not the origin so so th- these were uh, rather you know gravitational waves that are caused when there are some massive stars collide or uh, yeah so, and that's see, what they were what measuring what gravity gravity see, if imagine the space time continuum to be water you drop a it or you 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 know splash two sides of water together uh, you you have ripples right so those right. ripples are what gravitational waves are and these ripples are caused by you know black holes and black holes colliding black holes and neutron stars colliding or neutron stars and neutron stars colliding okay like, as of now only this much has been observed between okay. neutron stars and black holes okay okay and uh, this the, okay so uh, go ahead further and just talk about your thesis yeah. uh, so my project what i did was uh, we uh, considered a particular uh, uh, gravitational wave event it's called a gravitational wave event there have been multiple events that have been observed the first mm-hmm. observed in september 2015 uh, so after that you have a lot of things that have been observed everything will be defined with its date the month and year and day so like that different events were observed so what i did was i study the effect of orbital eccentricity in parameter estimation parameter as in what are the different parameters of the gravitational wave um, so i used uh, uh, i studied the effect of orbital eccentricity in parameter estimation analysis for ground based gravitational wave detectors you know we have the ligo which is the gravitational wave detector mm-hmm. so 
there are two types of gravitational wave detectors one is ground based one is one is space based the lisa ligo is ground based laser interferometer gravitational wave observatory okay lisa is a space observatory which is also a gravitational wave observatory okay so uh, i i did i did my studies based on gra ground detectors ground based okay detectors. okay uh, so let's uh, you know let's stop here and go to some of the questions that um, uh, you know various people have asked and particularly uh, let's let's look at some of the uh, simpler things so let you know i let me present my understanding from your lecture uh, is that you know uh, hydrogen clouds eventually uh, result in uh, stars stars burn when i say burn is a, a set of you know nuclear fusion reactions in which uh starting from hydrogen hydrogen becomes helium then uh during a sequence of uh, nuclear fusion reactions you keep getting various other elements yeah not you, nuclear fusion reactions nuclear uh, radioactive reactions nuclear fusion reactions both take place because after the formation of helium it's not just fusion it's also radioactive because you get the emission of neutrinos and x rays and gamma rays come out because okay when uh, uh collide, it's not going to be just fusion yeah so uh, you know let me just ask all the questions so you can just break them up and answer and then a sequence of elements that we know today happen uh, perhaps not everything as per the periodic table it's like it's not like hydrogen first then helium hydrogen already was there helium forms then it is not necessary that next lithium forms next beryllium forms etc there are certain things that get formed through nuclear fusion let's say <laughs> right and then there are other set of reactions that probably fill up something in between then you mentioned that it ends with iron okay and then various other pieces are formed so shantala in fact wants to know you know fusing elements heavier than iron inside stars what is specific about iron here that's what she asks why we know okay. uh, so yeah, let's yeah. say hydrogen to iron and then everything why in between why stop at iron yeah why stop at iron what happens after that so what is this i mean can you just clarify uh, so this? Uh, from what i've understood why there are some aspects of what happens in the stars that mm -hmm. are uh, mostly understood in lines of it it happens like this and that's how we know it okay so if uh, the observation that majorly it stopped at iron and nickel was an observational observation based fact okay it was not more like a theory based fact it was an observation based fact so okay after that whatever happened had some form of uh, nuclear radioactive processes taking place so the heavier the element got post iron hmm the more uh, 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 radioactive processes it had to take place so from my understanding i would say it was because it's an observational fact and it it happened like this there is no specific reason or at least i am not aware of any specific reason why it stopped at iron more than the fact that it was observational okay so uh, i okay so let's perhaps not uh, go too much into that Uh, there i i am assuming that uh, you know some of those uh, nuclear fusion reactions see the point is that uh, you need uh, you know for uh, a yeah, higher element so for example uh, four hydrogen atoms come together to form a helium atom in the process a little bit of uh, uh, you know mass is lost which Uh, is emitted as uh, heat and uh, uh, light mm. right this is the simplest star reaction that i know mm. then subsequently at some point you know helium uh, must fuse together fuse. to form something else you know when the star runs out of hydrogen to fuse together to form helium right then like helium should pressure and nuclear pressure from the opposite side it starts helium starts so, coming uh, i mean based on whatever i have read i sort of remember that beyond uh, you know iron fusion may not result in uh, energy uh, uh, further energy being generated 
so at that point you know uh, fusion pretty much stops and sort of iron i guess is sort of that point where uh, uh, you know smaller ones uh, don't necessarily combine together to form a larger one thereafter you know as you mentioned uh, things like uh, electron capture uh, proton uh, converting into a neutron then uh, certain other kinds of reactions come in because end of the day when uh, the, let's go to the topic itself right um, so uh, just yeah. once again uh, yeah. so the part, the part where i mentioned it stops iron it's an observation fact the thing is like you mentioned like right now the point where it stops is iron is because when uh, due to the pressure gravitational pressure and nuclear pressure acting simultaneously you have electrons falling to the center of the star so fast that it generates energy such high temperatures and pressure so hydrogen forms helium and in that constitutes 99% of the life of a star so after this what happens is there is a constant production of energy and consumption of energy simultaneously okay. when it runs out of hydrogen and has basically only helium Uh, I think we have lost her, lost her connectivity. Hopefully, she will join shortly. Uh, please, please stay with us. Uh, we will just uh, wait for a couple of minutes and then continue our conversation with Deepthi. Apologies for the interruption. Yeah. Okay, she's just joined. Just stay with us for a second uh, and we will have. Deepthi, uh... can you, uh... can you come on video? Ittu, can you hear me? Um, hello, sir. I'm sorry. I don't know. Actually, it said authorizing or some authorization issue. Oh, uh, no problem. Probably some uh, uh, connectivity loss. Uh, so can, can we continue now? Yeah, yeah. So what yeah. happens is by the time uh, the star runs out of hydrogen to fuse, which basic it's a it's a double dependent process where the amount of energy produced by the fusion gives enough energy for rest of the fusion to take place. So okay. when runs out of uh, uh, hydrogen to fuse together to form helium, the temperature starts dropping. So the uh, amount of energy needed for helium to fuse together to form carbon and eventually nitrogen and then it, it goes on till iron only till so much energy is left. So by the time iron is formed, the outer su surface of the star is cooled down and is drifted off into space. So you don't have okay. heat and the pressure to fuse uh, iron together to form higher elements. Okay. Uh, so, Shantala has a follow-up question. Uh, is there a possibility of elements heavier than what are currently found in periodic table? I'm talking about including what we have been uh, cooking here in the laboratory. 
is it likely that you know we can get uh, something with uh, you know maybe 120 130 atomic number tomorrow in a star is it even likely maybe if we start finding stars 30 billion years away maybe there there are elements that we barely know you know okay. rise to alien life they have things like vibranium and adamantium okay uh, now i want to uh, come back to a point that you mentioned which is that uh, you you said that uh, we found uh, uh, some uh, uh, nebulae or uh, stars which are uh, even uh, more than uh, 15 16 uh, yeah yeah uh, yeah uh, can you just explain that you know that i i have not really heard of it so i'm quite curious uh, so it's on, see basically it's only the distance uh, the uh, one light year is basically the distance correct. travels in i i understand that one Earth but year. then yeah so well, but you, then so so what you are saying is that uh, there are uh, stars which are uh, maybe you know 18 uh, 16 to 18 uh, billion light years away from where we are right <laughs> but it may have been caused by the uh you know expansion, expansion of the, of the uh, uh, space time itself right yeah 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 true but the thing is the expansion of the universe is proportionate to the velocity in which things are moving away from us the hubble's law there is this thing called the hubble's law right h is the hubble's constant h is equal to v into d velocity into distance so uh the thing is when you when they are uh, when you send a space probe out and it mm-hmm. in millions and millions of kilometers away obviously it is also accounting for the expansion in the universe so when you okay. find something that's billions of years away and you know what the rate of expansion is you can you know make the calculation and see how far away it actually is and it will still be older than the big bang okay now this is surprising you know i have to read up uh, to understand more about this uh, uh, maybe you know uh, we'll we will have a we'll have a conversation offline about this Sure, uh, there is a there is a question from uh, uh, Ramaswamy says when and how will we become star dust again? <laughs> so okay, so it comes from you know even the very topic itself that uh, we are composed of elements which uh, could have happened only by way of uh, stars creating a succession of various elements, and then uh, after the some stars have died, they have become. Uh, bits and pieces as planets we are one such planet and out of this planet uh, life forms have evolved and we are that okay now how are we likely to become stardust once again by stardust what do you like you have to define stardust because iron is also stardust carbon is also stardust no no correct so that is like you know uh, i am assuming that you know it's probably a question in just where uh, when when our uh, solar system uh, collapses again and uh, that means that basically the whole of uh, life forms and uh, on earth will all die out and uh, when all of this gets sucked into uh, perhaps a uh, you know, heavier body a black hole uh, etc then everything gets destroyed we are reborn as uh, hydrogen uh, another star is born then that the star, star goes through a lot of yeah. uh, changes and then we become uh, you know pieces of carbon and uh, iron etc then we go and uh, become part of another uh, yet another uh, yeah probably uh, we are right now going through all these procedures only thing is right. we perceive the future because as human beings we are psychologically bound to look at time in one direction but the past right. already exists so maybe we are going through it through it already okay uh, and talking of which i said uh, ramaswami might have asked it in jest uh-huh. but ramanan actually wants to know what is jest which is j e s t one of the things that you mentioned in your uh, okay talk. so jest is joint entrance screening test okay one what is that i've national it's one of the national entrance tests uh, approved by the ugc for the award of phd programs in central institute Sweet. Uh, and is it specifically for uh, astrophysics or for no, no, no. it's specifically uh, for physics and computer science aha uh-huh. it's okay. been held only for these two subjects very interesting i've never really heard of it uh, i learned uh, on the other hand is specific to astrophysics because it's only for iu ka okay okay thank you thank you for that information uh, prahlad uh, has a question which he has asked a couple of times 
can bursting of a star create wormhole so for which you have to really talk about what a wormhole is and then uh, yeah. explain this so for a wormhole we need to first talk about what a white hole is and a white hole is something that's entirely opposite to black hole black hole is something that sucks everything inside and doesn't even let light escape right a white hole is something that is so bright and everything gets comes just out of it so okay wormhole is uh, uh it's like you know the simplest explanation is what they gave in interstellar and so i have not studied much about wormhole because these things fall under the category of you know if i have to give an uh, a solid scientific explanation this for mm-hmm. the theoretical astrophysics and theoretical cosmology which i am yet to study because that's got to be a part okay. of okay so sometimes sometimes i find that these are uh, these are only meant for science fiction and uh, fancy movies and probably uh, you know something that we have not even observed or studied or uh, theoretically created a model for it or an equation so unless there is an equation and something that Uh, is explainable uh, i think they are uh, probably fanciful i don't know i'm mean, it's just my view uh, okay so let's let's uh, let's then jump to a uh, couple of uh, more questions before we wind up the session one is that uh, uh, let's look at some of these standard stuff right uh, earlier we knew only about our planetary system the stars were for us something uh, that didn't even move or at least that's what i'm talking about the early uh, civilizations like the indic civilization and what uh, we were observing our understanding was that the planets move uh, stars are stationary because by and large uh, they don't uh, you know uh, they are they move but uh, in our uh, observed time frame the movement is very limited or we couldn't even measure it then slowly our understanding particularly since the uh, late 19th century and uh, uh, right through the 20th century we have had so much of observations we understood that we are not the only uh, you know civilization uh, uh, planet no, i mean yeah go beyond that we are not the only solar system there are multiple yeah, yeah. solar systems yeah. there are galaxies yeah. there are we are not the only galaxy yeah. there are other galaxies right and then suddenly we find that we actually have trillions of uh, uh, celestial bodies yeah. celestial bodies of all kinds uh, then uh, things such as black holes and all kinds of stars the neutron stars the uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the white dwarfs red dwarfs uh, you know multicolored uh, stars um, you know uh, binary stars quasars pulsars i mean i, I you know they they are plethora of things mm. right now as an astrophysicist today what are the things that and then then this uh, whole uh, expansion of the uh, universe itself the uh, uh, you know einsteinian's equation uh, of general theory of relativity explaining all these things hubble's law and uh, gravitational waves uh, so much has happened so what do astrophysicists seriously study today what are the problems that uh, they are trying to solve what are the unsolved problems in astrophysics that people are really looking at today okay so some of the problems that i know are if you take the case of gravitational wave astronomy so until very recently there are only certain types of collisions that they had observed like i mm-hmm. mentioned before they record every event and every single they they would say that this event produced this gravitational wave this event produced this gravitational wave by studying the gravitational wave so this they do by means of studying the mass the density the uh, mass ratio of the objects that are colliding together the uh, amount of uh, the momentum the how far away both of them were before they collided so all these things they study that uh, so on on uh, um, like you study for example there are two objects a and b until now studied only collisions of a a and b b they have not studied collisions of a and b so that the, okay. so one consistent problem is i know that this thing is the source of this thing but is this the only source are there other sources too okay so if i say that uh, i can get x rays x ray emissions from 
the crab nebula mm mm-hmm. crab nebula the only source of x rays so such questions are going to be constantly bothering astrophysicists where we have to be constantly on the lookout because we'll never know we can never reach the end of the list because there is no list we only have to keep looking so that is one thing second one is a robust model for the expansion of the universe because right now the uh, uh, first theory big bang said that there was one big bang and everything occurred okay and then the steady state theory the hoyle narlikar theory happened which said which said that you there was no one big bang everything has been there since whenever there is no beginning there is no end there have been multiple big bangs because originally for the big bang what people claimed as the proof was uh, we observe red shifts uniform red shifts and then there is the cosmic right. the background all these things are like somewhat proofs for the big bang but that can also be the case for you know a steady state universe where it could be like there are multiple small small big bangs happening everywhere and that could have like you know in regular intervals you have irregular red shifts that can account for one large red shift so okay there are things that you know from what, what i studied and the kind of uh, uh, you know astrophysics problems or the astrophysicists i have met and what they have said i came to the understanding that there is no one single list where you can go there is only a short term goal and there is a long term goal and then there is the infinite pursuit okay so oh, that's very interesting really because at, i thought that at some point in time fred hoyle's theory was completely of the steady state uh, universe uh, was completely debunked and uh, you know the expansion uh, became the uh, norm and then you know now i think you know post uh, you know narlikar oh, no, i but, guess uh, ha yeah because the hoyle narlikar theory does not rule away with expansion there is still going to be expansion except that it was it did not start when there was one big bang expansion okay. has been happening that's all yeah uh, and i really like that list of books that you gave uh, that i know couple of the popular ones i have read i now want to read through uh, some of the uh, you know serious uh, stuff to see if i can understand and follow this is fantastic um, now let's come to uh, a couple of uh, you know maybe one one last question now if you want to really take up a topic and pursue further research what uh, would you uh, take up what would be your phd thesis if you are really uh, saying you know you are going to take up a phd thesis i don't know i have not been exposed to astrophysics in so much depth that i can decide a thesis but the no, i mean uh, see uh, all of us of you me, know when you have done your masters you have you have gone through so much of uh, you know winter program summer programs so that's quite uh, uh, quite nice really i mean the, the kind of uh, Uh, opportunities that you have pursued and you have uh, taken so it's not i'm not talking about your final thesis conclusion i'm only say, uh, trying yeah, to find out what is it that you would like to pursue out of this uh, whole area i have been excited about time travel like anybody so if not time travel it's like time travel is not something that that can be completely debunked out of question so you can always work on things like seriously i still think time travel is a uh, childish uh, no no, no. it's definitely stuff. it's definitely fiction as of now i'm not saying i want to work on time travel from my phd thesis at the very okay. fact that we are looking at stars 13 billion years away from us is basically looking at stars in the past that you basically Correct. sent a probe through time so time travel is not the one where you are like you go through a, a space a vehicle and end up as a five year old me not right. kind of thing but there are two things i'm interested in one is this and the other one is those undefined parts of the universe where you know 5% is still uh, only 5% has been defined you know 5% only the five type of matter that exists in the universe only 5% of it has been defined right the rest 95% dark matter and dark energy you know these yeah, are i i i didn't even uh, talk about those two uh, because i'm not even sure whether it is worth talking about it because it is still a distant theoretical concept right Uh, yes, we are yes. still, you know, but, but as a, there has uh, been uh, there is like evident proof that something undefinable is existing. Uh, I, I agree, but but you still uh, say that it is un, undefined, and therefore uh, it's it's a worthy research topic. It but is. how do you explain that to uh, people? Uh, you know, you can you can only say, uh, you know, uh, the universe has lots of stuff 
of which what we understand is only about 5%. There is uh, that is the visible uh, or uh, measurable uh, interactable items. Uh, the rest is all like, uh, uh, you know, dark, dark matter and dark energy. Stuff that we don't even know anything about. So that's physically explainable. The thing is, when you say only 5% is perceivable, rest 95% is not perceivable. I'm not making mm -hmm. something. I'm saying there is this much energy coming in. I can explain 5% of this energy. And there are also effects that I'm facing. I don't know where these effects are coming from. That is what I have termed as dark matter. There is this thing called, experiment called as, or the plot called as the rotational curve. So okay. this is thing we got to study back at Ayuka, where we plotted the rotational curve from the data that we obtained from studying the uh, uh, hydrogen cloud data. So we okay. plot that. And what you observe is Kepler was the first one to give a rotational curve for Milky Way. So it's supposed to be in a particular shape. And what happened was it ended up not being in that shape. It ended up showing us that there are velocity and mass effects that we are seeing with our own eyes that are not explained. You can't see no mass there. You can't see any uh, uh, light coming from there. But you're just, you're feeling the effects of mass. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. There is matter that exists there, which you can't see or which you can't perceive, but you feel the effect. Okay. So dark matter does exist. The studies are going on. There are possible proposed candidates for dark matter, like the axion. And mm -hmm. the ideas was what I wanted to work in during my MSc. It was just- Excellent like a study it, it, it was not like a research project but it was a study when I said considering both Einstein condensate which was claimed to be uh, one form of uh, you know uh, matter mm -hmm. possible candidate for dark matter so there, are, there have been okay. good studies on candidates of dark matter done by people here at IMSC okay okay uh, that is thank one you. of my uh, other very interesting yeah topics. yeah that's like a, that's a, a that's a good answer to the question uh, thank you in fact uh, your uh, talk is uh, quite inspirational of uh, how uh, you can get inspired by something in your 12th standard the finding of higgs boson right and that has led you into uh, you know pursuing uh, something which you have become very passionate about and uh, you communicated that quite well. Uh, you know, it's a very rewarding session. Uh, and the amount of information that you provided, particularly for uh, students who may want to pursue a serious study in that particular direction, uh, it's been uh, really wonderful, uh, uh, Deepthi. I'm sure you know, we Thank can you, keep sir. talking about it for a, a long time, uh, but I will uh, you know, stop uh, here. Uh, there is more, there's, there's a lot. Maybe you know, we should organize some interesting uh, workshops it's proposed by uh, uh, you know rv one of our uh, uh, organizers uh, maybe uh, we can create some programs and uh, get uh, more people involved you know beyond uh, popular talk let's just try to uh, uh, go a little bit into uh, uh, expanding you know maybe create this into a five hour session or something like that we will we will uh, discuss that uh, uh, in the coming days uh, thank you very much and uh, uh, thank you for all the viewers. Uh, I know there are more questions, but I think we have uh, run out of time. Uh, so thank you. Thank you once again, uh, Deepthi, for a fascinating uh, uh, day, a fascinating session. Uh, I really enjoyed it uh, a lot. Thank you. Thank uh, you, sir. This, uh, we, we will again, uh, you know, friends, we will meet again uh, next uh, uh, month with another topic. Uh, Deepthi, you please stay back. I'm uh, stopping you, the uh, uh, streaming session. Thank you, thank you.